Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you. Well, Mabrook, it's an incredible film. And alhamdulillah, salam, and Jad. This is, um, well, what can we say about this film? It's, it's obvious why it's won the hearts of audiences and critics around the world. I'm Anne Bernard. I'm a journalist with the New York Times, and I led the coverage of Syria uh, from 2012 to 2018 when I was Beirut bureau chief. Uh, and uh, you probably don't remember me among the hundreds of people that you spoke to, but I vividly remember that we were in Geneva and the talks were breaking down because of the regime attack. And I remember you going back in at that time, I don't know if I spoke to you or one of your colleagues, um, but the dedication is just amazing. And the same with Wa'ad. I was going back this morning to the chats that we had uh, back then, um, and you were even in the middle of getting your family out and fi making your own films. You were in touch with me and Huayda and, and our, probably many other journalists letting us know what was going on. So it's, it's just amazing. Um, we're also joined by, uh, so this is so Dr. Hamza Al-Khatib and uh, Wad Al-Khatib and uh, the other director of For Sama, Edward Watts. Thanks for answering our questions. I just want to start with something very simple. Uh, you were filming for five years uh, on and off, and this must have been hundreds of hours of footage. And how did you get it out with you, and how did you start to organize it? Uh, unfortunately, in addition for all the risk and the dangerous situation. Hello? Thank you, sorry. Always like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always he helped me with everything. <laughs> uh, in addition for all the risk and the dangerous situation that it was and everything, also you are worried about this material. This material, which for me was like really worth than my, more than my life. Um, and as I was really worried about Sama and want to protect her, but also this material is the same for me. Uh, I've just decided to take that risk and take it out because it means everything happened. And without being there, without this filming, really no one will know what the details of the life. Uh, a lot of other great journalists were uh, in Aleppo and they were filming. We were uploading some footage, but the huge amount of footage still with us. Uh, so when we left with the last convoy, uh, I've put them all in one bag, and I wear it in the opposite way. I was pregnant three months with Taima at that time, and I wear it, and then I wear a big jacket, which is, it was very, well, like winter. Uh, and then Sama was sitting all over this, and then her, um, like, small toy. So uh, I've just felt that this is the safest place ever, and if, I, if they will not be back, out, I will. Not, I don't want to be out, and like we were lucky enough to have that chance to get it out before really um, be chicken very very like um, let's say in a very high way, mm -hmm. and that was be what just because we left we were in the border at 4 a.m. in the morning. It was storming and heavy. They snowing. didn't bother to uh, really yeah, so look we inside. Yeah, so we were the last convoy. They just want all people to be out so they can like, announce their great factory uh, of getting, taking Aleppo. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, you have made this film from the perspective of a woman, a young woman, a mother. That's not usually the perspective we see on war. And do you think that gave you access to different stories? What kinds of stories did that allow you to get to that we couldn't otherwise? There was more challenges, but at the same time more, like let's say, positive way of that. Uh, anyone who lived in that situation, they have a, like a lot of challenging, whatever their role was, even the normal people who just want to work in a very simple things. It's just like very risky, very dangerous. Uh, also the... The, the situation there was very strange, even for the people who were living there before. This is just a strange situation, strange life, and the war zone, we've never thought that before. 
And at the same time, when I was like, uh, I lived in the city uh, in, in East Aleppo since 2012. And I wasn't just, uh, just a journalist coming to the place to film people and get out for stories. They've seen me living with them in the same neighborhood. We've shared the same happiness and sadness moments. They've seen me when I was pregnant taking my camera out. Sometimes the, their looks wasn't, like the people looks wasn't that good, but <laughs> at the same time, like with the time, if you ignore that with the time, you will feel that people really started to trust you, build that public trust between you and the people around. Uh, then when I have like Sama and taking like the camera and going out with Sama or sometimes even without Sama, like we had that relationship about people, they have knew me, not just uh, a journalist, but also not also the wife of the doctor, which also people <laughs> respect more, but also like someone who lived with them the same experience, we have the same issues. Uh, and as a woman, I, when I was like pregnant or then with summer, when I'm speaking to other women, they've, they've knew that I knew what they are speaking about, what they're feeling, what their uh, fears. And that's what make, I think, the film more special because it's just something, sometimes man doesn't feel this feeling. For example, whatever I explain, like what does that mean to be pregnant, to have a life uh, like inside you and all the death around, like Hamza can, can't <laughs> understand I wish, that. but like. <laughs> but also like a lot of challenges, which is we've just, should like focus on what you are doing, ignore everything around, and just like go forward for that. It's, I think it, we can all feel that you had this perspective both as a journalist and as a member of the community. That's what makes this so powerful, that it's, it's someone from Aleppo telling the story in their own way. Um, now I was wondering uh, about the structure of the film, uh, maybe Edward or Wad can, can address it. Uh, it you, you've made this decision to go backwards and forwards in time. And why was that? Well, yeah, I think one of the key things for us was to, we wanted to tell the truth of this human experience. And what was so clear in the amazing footage that Wag captured and just in themselves as people, I think was this mix of both the darkness and all the terrible things they'd seen, but also the humor and the humanity and the joy of life. And I think that was very true, as I understand it from their experience, it was coming through in the footage. And by moving between the different time zones, it allowed us to, to reflect that, you know, to both realize that even in the darkest moments, people's spirit still shines through, people are still trying to support each other, still love each other and, and uh, cheer each other on, encourage each other. And also, it was just like when you're telling a story, basically, when you're telling a story, you know, you start in one place and then you're like, oh, but how did we get here? You know, and so it also felt that it was a truer way of just, yeah, I guess, capturing like, their yeah, story in a personal normal way. Normal brain, when, you, when they will tell any story, they related some points with something before or, or after. Yeah. And we were rely on that. And even inside your own mind, you go back and forth in your memories, right? It's very exactly. You, the, yeah. you feel the film is putting us inside your mind. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. You become wad. Mm. <laughs> mm. uh, so you were in the middle of medical school uh, residency when the revolution began, Dr. Hamza. Um, how were you planning your life up to that point? Yeah. So. Basically, this wasn't my plan to be in New York filming our life when we were in <laughs> Syria. Uh, the, my, the original plan was to just graduate out of the university, go like just, I wasn't that related to, like or connected to Syria because I know that sit, like the country is full of corruption and I just want to just take that degree, go out like to Germany, to the UK or whatever place just and then uh, do my residency there and become like a specialist. But when the revolution uh, started, we became like more connected to the, to the ground more and more. And then when Eastern Aleppo was like announced as non-government controlled area, and remembering all the footage that I've seen on YouTube from Homs and Dara about the regime massacres and chilling to the any uh, area that's and that under the control of the regime, just felt the responsibility to be there. And that's when I moved from west side of Aleppo to east side and stayed there till 2016. And you too, Wad, you were also planning to go outside of Syria. And what happened for you? Uh, 
It's just like the same thing exactly. Before we don't belong to to Syria as Syria as our country. Our we don't we are not we weren't brown that we are Syrians, mm. and this is something I felt. It's not just me, but it's more common between all uh, my generation from people. And then when the revolution started, we just felt that okay, we we not just can change our life, but we can change the whole life of Syria. We even can change the world, and that's feeling about. Everyone who've seen like the uprising of the University of Aleppo and many other cities, you feel how people were really like full of hope, full of the well uh, of change, and that feeling like can't leave you even now with everything happened before uh, later. I still feel that feeling until now that we we will be in the day that we really can change that and we will see the free Syria that we dream of, even if it's like so far from now, but it's. It's real, and it, w it should be real. And if the, let's say, the universe, the, the universe is wrong, that will not happen, but it should be that. So basically from our generation, like when we, before the revolution, everyone's dream was to just go out of Syria, just flee. And after the revolution, everyone's dream was just to stay in Syria, and like, didn't happen at all, just part of the Syrian curse thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, exactly, um, there was, uh, there's a guy, his name is Anas, he's 23 uh, years old. Uh, he was a survivor from uh, a chemical weapon attack in Khan Shaykhoun, it's a small town next to Idlib. Uh, and he stayed, he, he decided even when we left and we let them down, uh, he decided to stay. And just today in the morning, uh, I think, around 10 a.m. in the morning. He was posting on his Instagram um, a photo of his camera and saying, we still, uh, we, we are okay. Uh, two hours later, we've seen his pictures full of social media that he, he will have been killed today in an airstrike. He's one of the white helmet uh, guys and he's a filmmaker. He's taking that, every photos we've seen from the white helmet, uh, he did a lot of that, and he just like today he's been killed. Uh, it's not about a story ended up with three years later. It's still happening until now, and even people who just ignore everything around the world and just thought about their belief and they wanna stay and they wanna do whatever they want just to to continue their own life there, and just. The regime and the Russia still insist that they want to destroy the people there. So just, I don't know what the positive message of, of this, but let's move on how, how we can, or what can we do for these people, how we can really change their life. It's not about just a story and we are survive and we are very lucky, but a lot of others not. And this is, uh, the point is that this is still happening. What you showed us happening in Aleppo, it's happening today in Idlib, and in Idlib city. It and happened in Ghouta, it happened in Dara, it happened before in Homs, it happened in Rustan, and now it's happening in, in Idlib. In the past three months, more than 26 health facilities were targeted. The same attack that you have witnessed on the CCTV happened 26 times in the past three months. More than 800 children were killed. The same brother that you you have seen lay down on that hospital 800 one of that brother one of that ch children were were killed during the past three months and it's still happening the the regime and the russians still calling those people terrorists and they want to take the ground and they want just to to make them flee but this time there is nowhere to go for those people and unfortunately like i will speak for myself and a lot of other syrian activists we feel helpless because we we've tried everything i've uh, for myself i've talked with the un i've spoken with more than 200 journalists when i was in aleppo in English, in Arabic, I tried so many languages. I sent a letter to Obama. I sent a letter to, that was a mistake. I sent a letter to, uh, to Merkel, Angelina Merkel. I've made a petition that was signed by 800,000 people. Like, I've tried so many things, and so many other activists have tried so many things in Aleppo, and then in Al-Ghouta, and then in Dara. And now the same thing is happening in, in Idlib. And we really, really felt, felt help I don't know like if the world just ignore us or no I, we have no idea what we have like I feel like I'm trying just to get back in memories and think what we have done wrong what like 
Should I send them, like, what, what should I have done right for anyone, any, like, the UN, the Security Council, to really act for, for, for us and or, or for, for, for the Syrians? So we've, we've made a message <coughs> when we were in, in, in Aleppo, and literally, it was, like, part of it, like, to the UN agencies and to the Security Council. And I said, literally, like, don't look back in time and say, and wish you can do something you can still do and they did nothing. But now also for, uh, for Idlib, please don't look back in time and see another film about Idlib and wish you can do something because we can, you can still do. And we still try more. You know, like, I will speak just on behalf of me and Hamza. We feel really very ho ho help uh, hopeless. But, you know, even with the film, when I've tried to make the film, I was very desperate. I know that maybe that will make no difference, but at least will save the narrative of Syria. At least if, if I give this chance to people, to decision makers, to normal people, to see what, li what life means in such a place like Aleppo and in such a place today like Idlib, maybe something will be changed. And this is just the hope that we still live like for as not just we, but also as like more than six million refugees around the world, all of them waiting for the, po uh, for the minute when Assad will be out of control so we can be back and do, like start our own life as Syrians in Syria. And there's something about Idlib that our audience may not know, which is that when you left Halab, when you left Aleppo, uh, your only choice was to go to Idlib. So Idlib was the only place that uh, people escaping Aleppo could go unless they wanted to go and take their chances under the regime. And so you were being evacuated to another place which is just under siege again and just being bombed again. Yeah, what people really like should understand that these three million civilians who are living now in Idlib, they are the survivor of Idlib, uh, of Aleppo, sorry. They were also the survivor of Al Ghouta. So this is, these people have this experience like times before, and th they've just now left and let down by all of us, by we first before anyone else, and just for really for nothing. Are any of your colleagues from the hospital in Idlib now uh, operating a hospital, and how are they? Yeah, the Al Quds Hospital is reopened in a city called uh, Adana, uh, in the countryside of Idlib, and uh, the same people are still working there, I'm still like communicating with them on a daily basis, and they're just doing a great job. So going to your point about how hard you tried, and believe me, so many Syrians that I know speak like you, they, 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 they say, where did we go wrong? What should we have done? How can the world be this way? You know, going through this soul searching about it, and I think we as journalists also feel that to a different, uh, in a different way, but uh, what, how does it feel now, uh, you know, as you look back at this now, and the film is getting a lot of attention, which is great, and it's correcting that narrative in people's minds that, that uh, you know, that this w war was really just about Assad trying to defeat ISIS, which is something that only came up years into it, and, and it's, it didn't begin with that. Uh, so, so is it too little too late, the attention to this film, and can, can it still make a difference if people understand that narrative, as you said? Maybe it's too late for Aleppo, but it doesn't matter because what we have today is Idlib, and it's not late at all. Every one single life we can save in this situation right now, that will be like a, a big achievement. The, the save the narrative and speak about the Syria as it's not a civil war, but it's a revolution. And what's, what's happened, it's not just uh, people fighting each other in, in one country. But if it's Russia, it's Iran, it's uh, Assad regime against normal people. Uh, it's all these things is really very helpful and it's uh, very make people not just understand, but also save that for our children, for the future, for, for us as a human being. What that history we will left behind when we will pass away. And does it make a difference to the rest of the world for things that may happen elsewhere in the world to understand this narrative? That's what I was going to say. Like the, I think and hope that the film might like change different, uh, like 
be helpful regarding the narrative in so, on so many levels. Uh, it might be too late for us because we're now like out of Aleppo and it's all controlled and by the regime, but it's not too late for Idlib. It might change uh, several people's mind about like women in film industry. About I, I had a call for several of my friends after the film in, in, in Cannes and several other awards. Call me, like They call like, we are sorry because we were like making jokes about you. Like how come you let your wife with you? Like you just, just sent her to Turkey. And I feel that that in some way, like uh, a small not a small victory, if that was a correct word, against like the the uh, the man had said about uh, the woman role in the society, in the community, in the film industry, in in, in the revolution itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think other parts of the world, like it's not only about, about Syria, but we're talking about Yemen, Sudan, Afghanistan, uh, Venezuela. I think the, the, the same issue, the same dictatorship is like they all like respond the same and they're all supported by Russia, so. And we're just like, I think the important thing as well is like we're trying to use the film as a rallying point to say, you know, we, we, the world, allowed this to happen, you know? And now through the film, I think people can really understand like what the Syrian conflict was about, you know, and what we've allowed to happen on our watch. And there are no easy answers in this world anymore with all the problems, but so many of the issues started in Syria, you know? The ripples, the refugee crisis, ISIS, the effect that that's had on our politics, and I think... It's driven the rise of the right wing it in has, a way. It has, you know? And so I think we need to understand now, and what we hope the film does, is that it's not the case anymore that you can say, oh, that's happening to those people over there, and that's such a shame. We're all fundamentally connected now, and it is our responsibility, as hard as it is, to work out how we can help people like Wad and Hamza and the people of Idlib right now, because it will affect us all if these crimes are happening essentially with impunity. And finally, speaking of the crimes happening with impunity, uh, as we look at the situation now, it looks like Assad has, has won, has stayed in power. Uh, what do you say to this idea? Uh, I will laugh first, like, because what does that winning mean? You know, like, it's a full, like, it's more than six million people around the world are refugee. Like all, most of the cities are totally destroyed. We have more than like, you've seen just 11,000 pictures of people who were detainees and they were killed in Assad prisons. And we don't know how many other people still there. Uh, it's like in all situation, you know, in edu educational situation, if you want just like to go to the, to see the regime areas and how people live there, it's like disaster. It's disaster more than when we were there. More corruption than yeah, before. Yeah, more corruption than before, more uh, like fear than before. And it's all just because of that idea about, okay, Assad will, will stay in rule. And I don't know, you know, it's just unbelievable how they, people can really um, clap for this idea about Assad victory. Well, thank you so much. You've given us an amazing legacy with this film, and I hope that uh, the whole world will see it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much thank for you. all.